Hello, everyone. Welcome to the session, Learning Forward, how the right kind of digitization can transform education. My name is Heidi, Heidi Wang. Um, I'm with Wacom for about 10 years already. I'm always in charge for technology, innovations, but most important also partnerships. Today, I'm very honored to have Max, Max Mendler with me. Max Mendler is a great thought leader, um, entrepreneur at the same time, and really big heart, passion um, for education. Max, do you want to say some words to introduce yourself first? Yeah, thank you, Heidi. Thanks for having me here. It's an honor to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yes, I'm, um, I'm Max, Max Mendler. I'm the founder of EduKey, which is the largest community of teachers in continental Europe. It's about 1 million teachers that use our platform to share ideas and resources uh, to collectively improve their teaching. And I'm also here today because I met Heidi recently over the last two years through an initiative called Wir für Schule, which is the largest European hackathon for education that was started during the pandemic. And we got 6,500 students and parents and teachers together for a week to hack the future of education. And there's lots of ideas that came out of that. And I believe we're gonna talk about some of those um, while we're here. Thank you, Max. Well, today we are um, here and I invited Max to join me to have a dialogue and discussion about a couple of key hypotheses we have been really engaging ourselves over the last couple of months. It's about how grassroots movements, really community-driven, um, bottom-up initiatives um, will finally make an impact in the education landscape, um, especially when we move towards a future type of education. So let's get started. Um, Max, we discussed recently about hypothesis one, right? So pandemic seeds grassroots movement in education. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we also discussed how much of that was a dream and how much of that is now finally becoming a reality. And um, I wonder whether this awful pandemic, which has been a nightmare all over the globe, particularly for everyone involved in education, and that's mm -hmm. teachers and parents, but also most of all kids, um, how this, this nightmare and this challenge and this struggle has also been an eye opener. Um, possibly an accelerator of things, and uh, including a grassroots um, movement towards a better education. And I think that's so desperately needed because when you look at the state of education around the globe, it's, well, mediocre at best. There's okay. huge differences globally, but I think wherever you look, there's, there's two massive challenges the pandemic has exposed. And let's talk about one of those first. The, the one challenge um, we see is underfunding. The infrastructure of education is poor. I mean, what is more important for the future of the next generations? Maybe climate change, yes. But other than that, education. And we're not funding education adequately. That's true for a lot of countries, and that's particularly true, and this is slightly embarrassing to say, for a country as rich and powerful as Germany, where when you walk into a school around here, you're not going to find great infrastructure, be it computers, be it Wi-Fi, be it software. It's really embarrassing um, how poorly equipped our educational systems are. And the pandemic showed that very, very blatantly, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we all got to see how difficult it was due to a bad infrastructure. But talking about funding, actually, I, I being in Germany myself, really, uh, I saw several like last minute funding that has been um, allocated now also driven by the pandemic situation, by the urgency. So, but still I see today um, teachers, students, um, parents, really desperately looking into how to utilize funding. Also schools, I hear some voices that actually they have challenges to use this funding. Now the fund is there. Um, seems like there is still some bottlenecks. Can you, what, what do you think? Oh, about totally, that? oh, totally. Yeah. Um, so we spend a lot of money on education. Mm -hmm. Germany spends 150 billion euros per year 
mm -hmm. on education. That's K-12, that's not kindergarten, not university, right? Mm -hmm. It's a lot of money flowing into that. We're also one of the few countries in the world that pays teachers adequately. An average teacher salary is over 50,000 euros a year. That's twice as much as some of our neighboring countries. So mm -hmm. it's not that there isn't any money flowing into it, but we have a structural challenge in Germany. So um, schools don't have their own budget. Everything is administered far away. So when there's money, it doesn't mean it gets spent in a way that the people on the ground would like it to be spent. And that's part of the challenge we have in Germany, those different levels of, um, of administration uh -huh. and of decision making. Yeah. But actually, there's, I see a lot of positive momentum as well. And talking about grassroots, really, uh, meeting teachers and parents. I, I personally think they are really creative and they did well by helping each other. And I, I'm sure um, you mentioned Eduki. So I met, I'm honored to also um, met some of the teachers who are engaged there. And it's really amazing also how to see the positive sides of this acceleration, um, that these people are really just taking the courage, the creativity um, to find ways. And this is also what we see with our engagement um, with other partners. Um, it's really, I see a clear impact that is positive and inspiring for me, especially. Absolutely. And I think it's composed of two things. So mm -hmm. when you look at the teachers, one is, I mean, they were thrown into the water from the deep end and the water was cold. They, they weren't equipped for that. They weren't equipped to teach via Zoom or any of those tools. I mean, they didn't even know whether they were allowed to use Zoom or any of those tools. They had to try everything new. Now, a lot of teachers have always tried new things, but never on a scale like this. So this has been a radical injection of courage. It's been a radical experiment of, damn, I need to try this. I've never done this before. Will I die? Oh, I didn't die. Maybe it's not so bad. And we've seen teacher attitudes change dramatically towards their own perceived limitations. They've begun to question a lot of the status quo. And that's partly because they needed to try stuff. And that's partly also because they felt an inadequate support from the system. A bit of a if you're leaving me alone right here, well, you know what? I'm just gonna do as I see fit. So, mm -hmm. and that leads to the grassroots question, right? That there's a there's a thing in there that's 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 a small plant of a I'm gonna do this anyway. And if others teachers join me in doing this, we're gonna do it and we're gonna change the system, no matter what these people up there think. And I think that's that's very, very exciting. This there's a second site. Um, sorry, Heidi, there's, there's, there's a second side of it, something yeah. that we saw in, in Eduki. So on our platform, um, it's peer-to-peer -peer exchange. So one teacher uploads an idea, a second later it's out there, another one might get inspired. With the day of school closures, the entire content changed. And obviously it changed towards materials and lesson plans that you could use in a digital environment, but it also changed towards a much more project-based learning and a much more individual speed of learning, right? Things that we've been talking about in education for decades, all of a sudden, because of the distance learning, they became a necessity. And, and that's the second great thing I, I see that teachers have tried out new ways of teaching over the last 20 months. And that's, mm -hmm. that's making me very hopeful. Yes, but still I hear voices or even concerns because now, very sadly, we are in the middle in Germany in the fourth wave, so many countries in the world as well of the pandemic. So I still feel the same urgency again. Like, okay, what if we close the schools again? What if we have to move to homeschooling again? So despite the fact that actually digitization has created some fundament and many teachers are equipped, they know how to use, as you said, Zoom team or whatever to communicate with the, teach with the students. Why is there still this uncertainty right now? What do you think? Well, I think we need to differentiate between two things. One is the infrastructure question. And unfortunately, we're really struggling in Germany, like in 
some other places, but more than in others. So when you look at the education systems around the world, you have some where all decisions are taken centrally. Mm -hmm. For example, in Greece, most of the decisions are taken at a national level. Greece decided to introduce Microsoft Teams as a communications tool very early on in the pandemic. Bam, it was done. Right? Then you have other countries like the Netherlands, where almost all decisions are made on the local level. The school principal actually has the budgets and the decision-making power to change things. Great. That was quick also. Now, in Germany, for very understandable historical reasons, our decisions are one quarter on the school level, one quarter on the district level, one quarter on the state level, and one quarter on the national level. And it becomes super complex. Um, when you decide what kind of software to use because so many people are involved and that's why we're so embarrassingly slow. Now, that's a shame, especially when you have three kids like ourselves and uh, you suffer from those mm -hmm. um, defaults of the system. But what I'm even more interested is what is going to happen once this pandemic is over in the sense that it becomes a normal um, flu, um, maybe in a year's time, who knows? Globally, it's gonna take a lot of uh, vaccination efforts. But how much of the learnings on different pedagogical styles of using technology in the classroom or around the classroom will stay? Are we really going back to the good old school of yesterday? I hope not because that was old, but not always good. Or are we taking some of those learnings and are we building a new school of the future? Oh, you, you really hit the point. I think, um, let me share also some experience we have um, at Wacom with, in other countries, right? We, we, work, we have a lot of partners. We engage with a lot of communities in not just in Europe, but also in Asia, in, U, in Americas. And it's really, I feel somehow the pattern is same, but speed is a bit different. And maybe the flavor to execute things are different, but it's always a combination, to be honest, of institutional initiatives, like government funds, um, public sectors really jumping on this. Um, but at the same time, I think the role of private sector, the so-called, or down to communities, really teachers and then parents engaging themselves in many like nonprofit initiatives. Like in Japan, I think it was way before pandemic where already this holistic approach is happening in the society. So um, institutions thinking about how to make Japan as a country forward to support the future generations. But I met a lot of thought leaders like you, actually. Um, and by the way, they will also speak at Connect Inc. in other sessions, really to share how, how they really, from their heart and from their own passion, um, wants to change and really have the courage to say, okay, let's do this from bottom up grassroots uh, approach. And more and more also now service companies um, for example, in Japan, again, here we also have a couple of partners with us um, in this 24 7 hour, uh, 27 hours, um, really sharing how they move even from an analog um, education service to help students and parents at the end um, to deal with um, the, 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 the future education growth of their kids and their children to move from an analog service to a digital one. So Japan really fascinating. You have a super valid point. Actually, you have several valid points in there. One is we need to learn from each other. Like Japan has changed the way um, you teach math 15 years ago. Not everyone in the world has followed suit, even though it's very, very clear that you found a better approach. Actually mm -hmm. taking the initial studies from the United States, there's cross-border learning that needs to happen. We have that in all sorts of domains. We can all, all learn from each other. Now, unfortunately, school systems are not designed to be learning institutions. They're designed to be preserving institutions. They have a bit of a national focus, which I think is a bit old school, um, and they, they, they tend to resist change. Mm -hmm. Now, there's, there's other players. There's students and teachers, and I think students and teachers are really fed up with the way schools work today. We have 80% of German speaking teachers on our platform and we hear this every day, the longing for change. Students, well, we don't need to talk about that much, right? I mean, they fall asleep at the wheel because a lot of the school still is very, very boring. Now, we have two other groups you mentioned, and I think they're, they're fundamental to the possibility of lasting change. One is parents and one is 
um, companies or um, mm -hmm. other parts of, of society. Now, parents, parents have been a challenge. Now, really? okay. par yes, <laughs> um, parents want their kids to succeed in school, right. naturally, because they want them to have the chances to lead a successful life later. But the way they think about school is the way they experienced school a generation ago. Um, they might encourage the kids to work hard, to get good grades, but they're not demanding for change. Um, and I think they need to think twice. I think they need to spend more time thinking about school, spend more time analyzing what's happening inside the schools, not just look at the grades and the results. And I think the second group is industry and other uh, parts of society telling schools we want a different outcome. For example, in our company, we do not look at school results at the grades. Actually, we delete that part from your CV when you apply. All that we're interested in is whether you're curious, whether you're courageous, whether you can collaborate with others, whether you're enthusiastic about education, whether you're optimistic. Like we, we look for those things, we test for those things, but not for school grades. We need to let the school system know that we're expecting different outcomes from them. And that's actually something we did this summer um, together with the federal government um, and the federal ministry of education in Germany and people representing those groups. We um, went through a horribly time consuming and complex um, process of coming up with a vision for the futures of schools in Germany. We actually randomly selected people from the population put them together over six weeks, and they came up with a vision for the future. And you know what? That vision looks fundamentally different from how schools oh, really? look today. Okay. Yeah, let me just give you two things, two things okay. that people demand, even though they have lots of differences. But what they agree on is, <laughs> one is every single kid needs to be able to learn fully all basic skills. We need to make schools just. Today, the school outcome is way too dependent on your parents' income. Right? There's a huge injustice in society, and schools are the one place that can counteract that. We need to take this seriously. This need means completely different funding for schools in difficult areas of your town. This means individual learning paces so that everyone gets to the level of basic skills like literacy or basic calculus. Um, big changes there. The second thing that group demands, and I think that's universal, is change to future skills. We're packing school with a lot of stuff, which is just simply outdated, that you can Google in an instant, that makes no sense to cram into kids' heads. We need to get rid of that baggage. That stuff was great half a century ago. It's no longer useful. We need to change the curriculum to future skills. Now, some of those are collaboration. Some of those are doing research in, in the new digital world. Um, some of those are emotional skills, resilience, optimism, how to deal with an ever faster changing world. And some of those are social skills, like how to collaborate, how to overcome differences in opinion, how to stick together as a society, those are the subjects of the future. Those are the things we need to demand. And those are the things the school need, uh, system needs to change in the future. That's very different from how schools look today. I just feel so impressed also when I, um, I was fortunate to be uh, part of the jury of the hackathon you mentioned, the, the German's biggest one. And I was so impressed because it's all about, because I was expecting when I go there, they would talk about technologies, what we need to make it more accessible or easier, but actually none of them. Actually, they were talking about future skills a lot, as you mentioned, and um, it was even um, students, kids. I remember next to me on the, on the jury was a panel, was a, I think, 12-year-old uh, junior high uh, a boy who were really expressing very with high confidence what he expects from education for the future. And this is so remarkable. And maybe you can share a little bit. I want to learn more how did actually politicians react after this uh, selection of the winner ideas about future curriculums? So, yes, I mean, that was 
heartwarming and it was surprising, but it was only surprising because we don't do it more often. This 12 year old, yes, might've been an exceptional kid, but actually there were thousands of those participating in the hackathon. Very often we talk about education, politicians talk about education. There's millions of people out there sitting in classrooms every day, experiencing educations. And yes, they do have a qualified um, opinion on how education is and how it should be. And when you bring them together and you listen to them, you take the time and you trust in their opinions, great things happen. We had students in the jury. We had students in the group designing the vision. We had students participating in groups. And yes, then sometimes a student happened to be the leader of that hackathon team forming. And in that team, there were parents and people working in the administration and some teachers, and the kid was the boss, right? Why not? We need to trust the people more. We give, need to give them a higher voice. Great things came out of that. For example, a group of kids said that one of the things they experienced in those school closures and the distance and even now wearing masks and all that is a lack of belonging, a lack of closeness, a feeling of isolation. Now, um, one thing that's dramatic is that 30 years ago, 90% of kids would say, I have a good friend in my class. Today, that's only 60%. 40% of kids don't have a close friend in their schoolroom. Now, they need help. They need someone mm -hmm. to talk to. And it was those kids saying, it's embarrassing. I'd rather talk to a chatbot before I talk to a human uh, being. Maybe because they've made the experience that in our school systems, human beings, especially the, uh, uh, the grown-up ones, tend to judge you, right? They tend yeah. to grade you. They tend to tell you you're wrong here. Um, if you wanna open up about psychological challenges, they say it's easier to talk to a chatbot and then later to a human being. And that's one of the projects that was developed there was a chatbot you can reach out to when you feel under psychological distress. How did the adults react on this <laughs> out of curiosity? Teachers and parents loved it. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, uh, the politicians also thought that was a great idea. So a lot of the use of technology, especially when it happens outside of the classroom, we find it's very, very easy to approve um, on a political level. What is much harder to approve on a political level is the idea of grassroots change, as well as the idea of radical change to the curriculum. And that's mainly because educational systems need to ensure quality. And a lot of people working at the top or within the educational administration see their role as ensuring quality. And that often is the opposite of grassroots. It's the opposite of giving decision-making power to the local level. It's the opposite of letting people change things dramatically. I, I was just always reflecting about um, our discussion because you talk a lot about future skills, right? And there's a lot of discussion, oh, let's move all to digital. Let's forget about the, go, the old analog way. Um, I want to bring this really to um, our belief at Wacom also is we need to preserve the best of the analog, which is the human factor, uh, which is the haptics, which is also the, the, the only way to express yourself, the creativity, because everyone growing up with was actually a pen in your hand and even using your fingers at the very beginning. But at the end, we believe the analog pen and ink. That's why for us, it's so important to grow, to innovate on new digital pen and ink experience in a meaningful way um, to complement the digitization. Because digitization, I think it's immensely important for the future generation because we are in the world of digital technologies. We have to um, be intrinsic part of it. and. I believe the future skills discussion cannot go without the analog way, what we want to bring into and, and integrate meaningfully um, to, the, to the new way of digital or future modern education. I'm Is totally this also with what you you're there. seeing? Yes, yes, I'm totally with you there. And I also think that when we talk about digital schools or digitalization of schools, um, we're, we're talking at a too abstract level. There's no point in just digitalization of everything. 
Um, right? So digital things can be good or bad. It depends on what you invest in and what you aim them at. There's, so you can't say um, they're just one thing. It's mm -hmm. much more complex than that. Um, now, if, you, if, if all you try to do is take a classroom and turn that into digital learning oh, with no. kids sitting at home watching Zoom, I mean, it's a nightmare. Yep. It's, it's hard enough to teach a classroom of kids. It's impossible, or at least it's no fun, uh, teaching a group of kids over Zoom more, for more than a day or two. Um, so replacing the analog with digital is a silly way of thinking about digital schools. Yep. Now, it only makes sense to use digital tools or systems if they fundamentally change something for the better, either because they allow you to do something that you weren't able to do beforehand, and there's lots of examples there, or because they make something an order of magnitude better than it was beforehand. And we need to talk about those things rather than digital schools in general, because that, that won't get us anywhere. Happy to hear this because this was always my worry when I read a lot of articles, especially discussions even we have in the industries, right? When we talk about digitization, it's all about let's digitize for the purpose of digitization. But I think this is the wrong approach. It has to come together with all the, the, the work streams you mentioned, like curriculum, like how to teach and how to meaningfully integrate technology innovation with the analog value of um, interaction, communication, processing, internalization, uh, creativity, you talk about critical thinking. So I think the world is really about bringing these two worlds. So this old world, new world, analog, let's say analog and digital together is equals way more than just the combination of both. I think this is something we have Absolutely. to Absolutely. So um, if you only take writing, I mean, that's only a small part of school, right? But let's focus on that for one second. Um, there's different types of writing for different purposes. Um, and for some of those, analog ways are great. And for some of those, digital ways are great. So you can't say digital writing is better than analog writing. It depends. For example, when you take notes, um, when you're in a thought process of trying to understand yourself, when you're journaling, right? When, you, when you're trying to understand the world through writing, as a creative process. Mm -hmm. Over generations and millennia, we've, we've used our writing skills as a way of thinking, right? It's not a finished thought that needs to be put onto paper and then communicated. It's while you write, you think. Um, a lot of note-taking is done in a, in a pen way. And I, I believe that's also part of what you're doing with Digital Ink. Now right. then, on the very other end, there's messaging. Mm -hmm. where you quickly need to shoot off some precise information to someone far away. Obviously, that needs to be digital. If you do that by letter, that's a bit, you hardly ever do that anymore mm -hmm. these days. So, and then obviously there's in between time uh, space and sometimes these overlap. Sometimes note taking and then selecting part of that and then storing that for later retrieval or even sharing that with others can be overlapping and, and that's where it gets really interesting and, and, and tricky. But we're never gonna throw away the analog world. Definitely, and let's remind me and connect me with uh, an initiative I'm driving with my team and we just had a, earlier today a session also with an expert in AI technology. Really, what I see personally as wor with worries is AI technology being adopted in education that often for many, many people, there's a misunderstanding that it means automation, it means, uh, follow the pattern, uh, as you said, you have to follow the, the standard and then you're in or you're not. So what we really want to drive here also from technology perspective, but really also from community engagement, <laughs> grassroots approach perspective is to change perspective of AI technology as an help actually to grow the skills, the future skills, um, the haptical um, preserve, really preserve the haptical feel of writing Give you an example, like if you write um, on the screen, how cool would it be as a, for the teacher to also understand, okay, how this child was feeling, is, is, is he or she stressed or is she or she concentrated? 
or where do I see um, he or she has most struggles so I can point or help assist the individual child to be better, to have a more comfort learning curve. And what I feel pity that is often misunderstood and there's a lot of misunderstanding to be honest. And that's, um, it's also a topic we heavily discussed in the, I, I think also in the, in the round around uh, in with the Schule as well. So how, how, how do you think, um, what's your view also when you engage with all the community members, users, um, teachers, parents, talking about AI and how to use it meaningfully in technology and in education? Yeah, so um, that's a great topic. And unfortunately, there's a huge misconception. Right. When you meet parents at a party or a dinner or something, you talk about AI in education, the first thing they think about is some robot or some higher intelligence taking over from the teacher. Mm -hmm. And replacing a teacher with artificial intelligence. I think that's a bad thought. A, it's never going to happen, hopefully, and B, if it does, it would be a bad thing. No one, no one can or should replace the teacher. The question is whether you can empower a teacher with AI. And I think that truly depends. Now, um, there's great potential in AI, and there's also a certain limitation. AI works well when you have vast amounts of data. So, Unfortunately, it can only be applied in certain parts of education. If you look at those certain parts of education, there's some where it has the potential of great benefits, and there's others where it has the potential of reinforcing dangers. Let's look at the benefits first. Mm -hmm. So for example, when you do early writing skills, I think you, you, you teach kids handwriting letters and, uh, uh, and numbers. Um, with the pressure of the pen, with the direction of the pen, the speed of the movement, um, all those things you can measure, you have a depth of data then can give you much more feedback on the status of learning of how to write than you ever could if you were just handed a piece of paper. Um, so that's one area where um, AI or, or, or data can improve things dramatically. Now. Unfortunately, one of the areas where we see the highest investment in AI is in the testing infrastructure. Um, mm -hmm. Across many countries of the world, we're trying to make tests more efficient by using systems um, based on vast amounts of data. Now in the testing context, unfortunately, the only things you can test are the ones where it's very clear where the answers are right or wrong. So you, you need right. a catalog of right or wrong answers. And then the machine can test whether you're right or wrong. And then it can suggest you to take this as the next challenge or that as the next challenge. Unfortunately, the things you can easily test are the ones that machines in the future can do much better than humans. Yep. So um, if you use AI to make standardized testing better, I think you're reinforcing an old way, a bad way of teaching to the test. We need to think of ways of using AI to encourage creativity, to encourage curiosity, to encourage social and emotional skills. And if we manage that, it can be a wonderful tool for better yeah. schools of the future. I always say the machine today, they probably can interpret, read what we are doing, can read the data, but I think the next level is the machine can understand us and the data. And this is something um, we really believe is the right way to drive also the whole society to create this awareness of AI. It's not about reading automation, putting me in boxes, but really about growing with me, adapting to me, understanding me, and provide me help when needed. Yes, and then is it understanding me as the student or is it understanding me as Correct. the teacher? Right. right. So um, technology can help me in the classroom. I'm talking about teachers a lot because that's, that's my corner. Um, it can help me in the classroom understand what I'm doing. Am yeah. I talking too much? Am I talking louder than other teachers? Am I using a different vocabulary than most teachers out there? Is it clear what I am saying? What is the reaction to the stuff that I'm saying? Can technology AI tell me 
help me how to read the class? Can it give me ideas? Not replace me, but inspire me with ideas, with hints. Look at that. This is what you're doing different from the rest of the crowd out there. And if it does that, it can be a truly powerful force. But I still think we're a couple of steps away from that. But that's the direction we need to take. Yeah, I may be a, a challenging question for you because uh, being in Germany, again, um, I think Germans, we are most conscious about individuality and but also data, right? They, you talk about, we talk about data, which is essential for a good AI um, technology and service. So with the message of data, um, why is it still not being adopted in German society? Because actually with the conscious of data security and respect for data, at the same time, also respect for individuals, freedom and an individual, let's say, um, growth path. So how come it's so slow actually in Germany to get this thought adopted? <laughs> I think we have a multiple personality disorder as Germans when it comes to data. So um, on the one hand, we talk about it a lot. And we cherish data protection. And you know that Europe now has a fairly comprehensive and modern data protection law, which is actually very, very similar to something we've had for a long time in Germany. We're, we're aware of that. We're good at that. We point it out wherever we go. Um, at the same time, Germany was the earliest and strongest adapter of Google, of Facebook, of Amazon, of any of those companies collecting huge amounts of data on you as an individual. So that's the first thing. While we talk about it a lot, we act very differently. Um, now, we talk about it a lot for historical reasons. Now, we've had two experiences in the last 100 years of all individual freedom being taken away. First with the National Socialist uh, 100 years ago, and then also with the uh, socialist regime in Eastern Germany for decades after that, where there was lots of supervising done by the state. And you were actually, your life could be in danger if you were recorded having said the wrong thing. That's partly forming our fear. Um, and that's understandable. And that needs to be addressed um, and put in the open. Now, unfortunately, one thing we're seeing in Germany, also in other countries, but particularly in Germany, is data protection being used as an excuse. Mm -hmm. Data protection is important, but it is often overrated, at least is often abused as, let's not do that. So you have a great idea, you have a great initiative. There's one parent in a school saying, but what about data protection? It's oh, off funny. the table. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Um, we need to learn how to address data protection issues in a rational manner and how to prioritize convenience, learning, AI outcomes and data protection. It needs to be done in a mix. It's never a standalone question, um, but we need to be rational about it rather than having this emotional, oh God, there's data involved, let's stop everything. I agree. And I think important, and this leads almost to the last hypothesis I want to um, discuss with you is um, accountability and responsibility on different levels, really. So um, we talk about grassroots movement, but at the end, I think it's an ecosystem that has to all share the same accountability in driving this momentum together. And really technology can only be at the end more um, running with the movement, but the movement comes from shared ownership, shared accountability and responsibility to drive this um, for the better actually of our future generation. This reflects or just reminds me also of Wacom's strongest belief is driving meaningful growth, as we always say. So meaningful growth, not for the sake of the company only, but really for the society and creating technology that helps the, um, the society to grow um, in the individual way for the different community. For us also the connection to partners and communities are so important. And I personally believe it can only come together. So industry cannot just invent great technologies, but at the same time, we need to really do much more to engage uh, with the user base, with the community, with partners also. 
um, which I can share also briefly. Um, we, we are really working since the pandemic started to seek about, okay, how can we team up with experts, other uh, experts, uh, experts in education, experts in tech, experts in software content, um, really to, to grow new way of um, using technologies in the, in the education sector and in the education use cases. So I think it's really a movement that all has to come together and not just dictate or relying on some parties or institutions only even, that would be the worst case, I believe. <laughs> Well, absolutely. I mean, the big challenges we face as a society are so big and so complex, yeah. they need all of us. Um, and that's from climate change to education, and there's a number of others, right? It's a, it's a complex world we live in. Not one person um, or one institution is going to fix that. Mm -hmm. um, totally with you. Um, and one thing that's making me very, very hopeful, if you look at who's applying to companies like ours to work for us, the young generation coming into the workforce, what they're asking is to do a meaningful job. And a meaningful job means that um, you have ways to explore yourself and, and to work creatively, but they're also asking us, so what's your impact on education? Um, we present ourselves as an impact business. They understand the business model, but what's the impact? Where are you making education better? And they're really asking those questions. They're also asking, what are you doing to prevent climate change? We're like, hang on, we're an education company, but <laughs> right. still, they want to know that. And, and if you don't have an answer there, they're not going to work for you. So it becomes a competitive advantage for any company in the war for talent to have an impact, to be clear about an impact. And, and they're going to sniff you out very, very quickly if this is just sugar coding from mm -hmm. a corporate social responsibility perspective. It needs to be in the heart of what you do. Um, you need to take that responsibility and be transparent about that. Otherwise, you won't have talented people working for you in the future. And that's something that's making me very, very hopeful. Yeah, we need talents, I think, everywhere in the future um, generations. Um, that's what we really also stand behind, what we believe stand behind in the meaningful growth. Also, um, just to close the loop, also to Inc., right? We talk a lot about Inc. technology. Just to emphasize for us, Digital ink, again, is not just, just a technology, but it's also not just a tool, for example, for the user, for the creators, for the um, teachers or students um, to write down things or to express themselves. But actually for us, digital ink or ink itself is equivalent and really representing and re responding uh, with the individuals, the, the future um, talents, you said, future skills, um, emotions. Um, we see this all being integrated in this um, the so-called ink experience, which is also coming together again to also um, reflect this um, center that all comes uh, with a connected approach. So it's technology, it is experience and the front end, but at the end, the human being is standing behind. So every ink stroke is representing the personality and the output of um, or thinking of individuals. So maybe um, um, the last question to you, because I'm curious how you think um, about how this journey can continue. How, how can we keep this momentum by bringing everyone on one table and say, we are sharing this, we have to do it. Um, it's one of the most challenging tasks, I think, for the society. So any suggestions, especially to us as an as a industry uh, representative, but what else? Do you think you can recommend or from your view, we should um, drive together more? So um, I think there's a number of things we all can do. Um, mm -hmm. The first one is we need to make education a top priority. Mm -hmm. When you look at national elections across the world, very, very rarely do you find education at the top spot. Sometimes you find it mentioned a little further below, but it's, it's sort of jobs and it's many other things before you get to education. We as parents and as companies need to change that. We need to tell public authorities and politicians that we see a need for change. We need to tell them that we hire people for creativity, not for the grade on the history course or whatever. Um, we need to make ourselves heard. We need to make sure this topic is on top of the list. The currency of politics is 
that others see that we're doing something on a topic that the society talks about. Mm -hmm. That's the driving force of politics, right? It's, it's reactive, it's reacting to the topic most important to society. So let's make this the number one topic. That's one mm -hmm. thing. The second thing is, let's encourage exchange across yeah. borders. Now, mm -hmm. one of the great things in education is there's nothing bigger than education. We have around 100 million teachers globally. We've done education forever. We do it everywhere and actually in very, very similar ways. We are operating in the German-speaking countries, but also all the Spanish-speaking countries from Spain all the way to Latin America and the French-speaking countries. Mm -hmm. And initially, we all think, oh, God, that's very different. That's culturally different. And the curriculum is different. But you know what? It's not. It's the same the core of it, 80% of it, is the same everywhere. Yeah. Um, and that's true whether you're in Shanghai or whether you're in Sao Paulo or whether you're in Stuttgart in Germany. Um, mm -hmm. So let's, let's, let's go beyond those perceived differences and see what we can learn from each other. And there are great examples everywhere. And one thing that you've just mentioned a minute ago is accountability. What right. I believe is um, when you look at districts, from Edmonton in uh, Canada to Chicago in the US to uh, many other places around the world is when you combine trust in the people on the ground with accountability, you get a fundamental gear shift yeah. in the quality of education. You need both of those. You need to trust the people, you need to give them the decision powers, but you need to hold them accountable. And that's where we need to move to. And that's still the exception in most places. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's too much centralized control. And we need to foster that exchange. And we need to point that out. As companies, we've been doing that more and more in a globalized world. Education system and education ministries have not done that enough. I totally agree. And that's why I believe personally, um, um, to also close this discussion so we can move a little bit to questions, is the grassroots movement will continue, honestly. It will continue. We will need to have these smaller momentums um, created by passionate um, groups. Um, this is how I see, and I think also startups um, are playing an important role here. So we cannot just rely on the established industries. Um, so startups plays an important role, but also more, as you said, I, I, I cannot more, do more than echoing um, how to bring this cross-border connection and cross-border meaning not just countries, but also different groups that they mingle together. And, um, but last thing, I think you're right. At the end, we have to put education on a much, much, much higher priority um, across all levels, across all discussions as our assets, right, to build for the future. That's all we have. Yeah, I agree. So this gives us a bit time for questions. So Julia, so do you see any questions uh, from the audience or online? Uh, if you're online, feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, offline, of course, raise your hand here. We will share with your mic. Thank Julia. you. Okay. Hi. Yes, I have two questions from the online chat so far. The first being, um, Max, you have already mentioned that the um, that decision making is so fragmented in Germany, and particularly, and so in percentages on different levels. So in regards to this, the question is, why is change in general in education so difficult in Germany? Is, is that the reason? Are there other factors playing into this? Yeah, I think there's two main reasons. The one is the, the system was set up like that right after the Second World War uh, to avoid the next nationalist, socialist government brainwashing kids' heads, right? So we, never, we should never forget that. It's designed for that. That's our federal system in generally. It's designed to resist change. Um, now, over the decades, more and more functions have been taken from that middle level, from that state level, and either put on the national level, from defense to, to uh, other topics, or down to the local levels, to the cities. So today, there's only two things left for, uh, for those states, and it is police and education. Some of the smaller things, but those are the big ones. Um, and if you want to, if, if you have a political career and you're moving up the ranks through the states and you want to play an important role in the federal government at one point, you need to hold on to those. 
otherwise there's nothing much left on that federal um, state level. So um, as it's been hollowed out and as it's the last thing there, politicians cling to it. We've talked about federal reform for many, many years. We've seen the earliest part of that with a multi-billion euro budget um, mm -hmm. recently introduced by the, by the national government, um, something that wasn't possible before. And that's the first steps of sort of diluting that mid-layer of power in the, in the states. Mm -hmm. But it's taking a long time. And uh, there's discussion with the incoming government um, of addressing that. But it's not going to be easy. And it's only going to be done when that grassroots movements of teachers and students and parents get so loud and saying, we can't take this anymore. We don't want this old school school system anymore. We want that change. Only then will they go through the difficult loops and the resistance and the challenge of, uh, of change and uh, get to the fundamentals of that system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And there is one more question that, that actually matches what you just mentioned, also these, these really uh, movements starting from the bottom up. If um, a, a school that so far hasn't been able to really um, make incredible changes, but wants to change just really internally as a school, what would you say are good first steps or the most important first steps to take if a school in itself says we want to do something? Now, schools do. There are great schools doing great things. That's already a, a good one. So one thing you can do is look out for, for schools that have taken the path and start talking to them. Um, a second one is don't be afraid. Now, a lot of the state control doesn't actually work. A lot of schools, <laughs> when they go to the edge of the rules, can do wonderful things. Just one example, this, the school that our kids go to. They sat together many years ago and they prioritized the curriculum. All the teachers sat down in a room with lots of paper and ink and they wrote down all the stuff that is in the national curriculum. And then they prioritized that, lots of debate. Is Latin more important than this? All that kind of stuff. And then they drew up a line in the middle and they threw away everything down there. They said, we love you, You're, it's great content. Unfortunately, we have no space for you because we're gonna replace you with a subject called courage, with a subject called experience, with a subject called helping others, right? So unfortunately you need to go. Now, the town of Berlin hasn't been able to build an airport for mm -hmm. the last 10 years. Would you really expect them to be able to control every school? No, they don't. So you can do a lot more than you might be legally allowed to, you need to be brave. And thirdly, I'd suggest bring everyone together, students, parents, your colleagues, and spend a day or a week mm -hmm. on writing down with ink or blood the vision of the school you want to build in 10 or 20 years. Right? Align on the vision, align on the big picture first, because otherwise you'll get stuck in those little, um, in those little steps by someone saying data protection. Um, and you need to have that vision to counter that. Yeah, great encouragement, great motivation. I, <laughs> I feel like I have to trigger this now. <laughs> great. <laughs> great. Any more questions? Go ahead. Uh, hi, um, I, I didn't study in Germany, uh, so I find the school system in Germany fairly complex, even to understand as someone uh, having studied outside. And um, my question is maybe um, some, any, to both of you, actually, yeah. how do we see technology's role in changing not just the way things are taught, but managing these different types of schools and like uh, the complexities in the education? Because um, I also believe that um, there needs to be different paths for different people to evolve. Like um, how, how, how would technology play a role in this? Maybe I start and then um, that's just to Max first. Um, I think technology has the role of bridging number one, because with technology, actually a lot of boundaries are, lo are gone actually and connected. And um, Max also mentioned a lot of the cross-border exchange. I think this is the number one benefit. We should really be aware and utilize this and encourage people to use it is connection and exchange. 
Um, secondly, I believe technology, as I mentioned, um, we are working about technology, own technology that should be adaptive, right? Fitting to the people, understanding the user, the individuals. And I believe technology can help actually to also um, accompany every child in the, in the past to select the right way to grow their skills, to set the right focus, and at the end also helps the parents and, and, and the, the teachers. I think Max mentioned it as also earlier, parents often are maybe um, too strict to try to put some expectations, but maybe that doesn't fit to the skills or the potentials of the um, kids. So I think technology has this important role also to, to encourage and to foster the individual growth at the end. And this is something I also call out to the industry. We have to work on more actually, instead of trying to focus on productivity or efficiency. So that's my um, thinking. So what do you think, Mark, Max? Yeah, um, I would echo that. So um, yes, unfortunately it is very complex. We have 94 different school types. If you just look at the labels of how schools are called, 94. Now um, that sounds very scary. And if you wanna study that, that's actually, um, that's a lot of work. Um, when you look beyond the labels, it might be called this or that. Beyond the label, they're actually fairly similar. Um, and the smaller you go, the more you break things down, once you get to the lesson tomorrow in the classroom, the more similar they get. Now, we at Eduki, we have 80% 80 of German-speaking teachers using the platform to prepare lessons. Now, obviously, they come from all different sorts of school types. But when they share ideas of how to introduce a concept or how to foster creativity in a ninth grade um, uh, classroom, it actually is the same thing, no matter where you are. That, that goes across borders within Germany, but also beyond the, the national borders. And if we invest in technology that allows teachers to share, then, um, then we are already breaking down some of those apparent differences and Part of that complexity. Yeah, totally agree. Good. Any more questions? Yeah. From the audience in Düsseldorf. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Um, rather a question to the both of you. Yeah. Um, I have listened with, uh, with very positive notions that teachers are also more and more open to change and they feel the same requirement as pupils um, have and in the middle of that um, the um, um, the parents are based somewhere um, we have also heard today how very important uh, digital ink and paper and this combination of both ways can be um, as a path to enable with technology to, to really proceed into the future. Um, what in your both perspectives is the best way to tell spe speciality, um, no specialty, no specially, uh, sorry, specially teachers about mm -hmm. that technology because um, I see, I'm, I'm, I'm a mother myself, um, I see a lot of hesitancy towards brands and technology mm -hmm. brands with teachers. But there is so much more than just pushing out one brand. It's really something that goes beyond this. So mm -hmm. um, how do you see that um, special, uh, special um, teachers and uh, principals should learn about digital ink? Yep. Maybe I start short uh, because we are running a bit out of time, but um, in short, I think you mentioned about brand. I think technology must work cross-platform, number one. So everything, I think digital ink, paper um, and pen, they should really um, be compatible with each other. And why are we restricted to a certain brand at the end? So we work on really foster cross-platform technologies. And for teacher to teacher, I can also share an anecdote. We have started initiative Teachers for Teachers. And I really see how teachers creatively decide themselves how they work with our product, with our technology and adapt their teaching method and then share it. And when it comes to sharing, I think um, Max, you have a lot to also um, to share your experience. The teachers are really also learning themselves. They are in a learning path themselves and it's so impressed to see how positive they are. So what do you think? Last yeah, comment. So, um, 
There's many teachers. There's one million yeah. German speaking teachers. Within a crowd of one million, you have all the differences you can think of. So some yeah. are against it, some are for it. A lot of them are in the middle. Now, when we started as a company um, five or six years ago, a lot of people were wary. What What do you want in there? Right? School is public. What What do you want as a private company? Yeah. Are you dangerous? And it took time and convincing. And with time, they learned we wish actually providing a service. Uh -huh. But yeah, patience. It does take time. Okay. Um, and the second thing um, I think is fairly often I see people coming from the outside telling teachers what to do. Hey, mm -hmm. use this. It's much better. Rather than um, replacing that idea with curiosity and going out and saying like, hey, what's your challenge? And maybe today it might not be sharing mm -hmm. teaching materials. Maybe today it might not be digital ink. Maybe today it's something completely different and then you can help with that. But maybe tomorrow it is. We Great. need to have a helping approach to teachers. Mm -hmm. Great. I think that's a great also closing comment um, to close the session. I feel like I can discuss with you forever. <laughs> I have many sessions here. Um, so let's stay connected. And if you have more questions, feel free to post in the chat. Max and I will also stay around a little bit to answer. Thank you and have a great day and rest of Connected Inc. Thank you, Max. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs>